Today I'd like to talk about uh, requirements for effective damper testing and specifically for NVH testing. My name is Byron Sari. I'm a principal R&D engineer at MTS Systems. I've been at MTS for 27 years. I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in aerospace engineering. My areas of expertise are elastomer testing, damper testing, control science, and dynamic system modeling. My areas of concentration are in the vehicle dynamics division and specifically the performance products. So performance products are products that we use to characterize systems, suspension systems, or the entire automobile for instance, or perhaps a train or a helicopter. So some of the systems I've worked on in the past are uh, KNC kinematic and compliant measurement systems, static KNCs, dynamic KNCs, KNCs for automobiles, KNCs for trains. Uh, I've worked on crash simulators, uh, helicopter iron bird simulators, and uh, I've worked on wind turbine fatigue test systems and servo electric systems. So here's uh, some pictures of some of the systems I've worked on over the years. Here we've got a KNC for trains. Here's a DKNC, Dynamic Kinematic and Compliance Measurement System. Here we've got a servo electric frame, which is an acumen. Here we've got a six degree of freedom bushing test system. Here's a damper system for uh, doing durability with mud slurry being applied to the damper. Here's a crash simulator and here's a wind turbine test system. Today I'm going to talk about uh, first automotive trends and uh, how that pertains to noise and vibration harshness testing. I'm going to talk about swish and chuckle specifically when I talk about noise vibration and harshness. I'm going to talk about the uh, test bench attributes for a good NVH system. Uh, it needs to have high fidelity actuator and I'll talk about that more as well as low frame induced vibrations, high resonant frequency. I'm going to talk about uh, high frequency transducers that are required to measure at these high audible frequencies. So I'm going to talk about noise vibration and harshness in the automobile. So noise is the acoustic portion, vibration is the mechanical vibrations, usually felt through uh, vibrations in the steering column or in the uh, steering wheel. And harshness is more of a subjective measure of how annoying these noise and vibration is. So noise itself could be acoustic noise or it could be vibrational noise, but I'm going to refer to noise as the acoustic part primarily throughout this presentation. So I may use the word noise and vibration harshness or noise vibration and harshness or noise and vibration interchangeably. So wind noise is a big source of acoustic noise into the cab. Uh, engine noise is a big source of acoustic noise into the cab as well. And also the engine can cause lots of vibrations that make their way into the cab through the chassis. And road noise is also another source of noise into the cab. We have uh, road vibrations that make their way up through the suspension and into the cab as well. Market trends. I want to talk about some market trends that are uh, creating more of a focus in NVH in the automobile industry today. So one of the market trends is the desire for a better ride in your car. As we see autonomous vehicles on the horizon, the operators of these autonomous vehicles are going to be very concerned with the comfort of this car. They're not going to be as concerned with the handling of the vehicle because they're not actually driving the vehicle anymore. So comfort is going to be a new focus. So while you're in an autonomous car, for instance, you may be reading a book, you may be working on your computer. In any case, you want a nice, smooth ride. Electric vehicles are also going to cause more of a focus on NVH in the automotive industry. Electric vehicles are going to create a drivetrain that's going to be quieter, a powertrain that's going to be quieter. And as these other components in the car get quieter, the road noise is going to be more noticeable. Lightweight chassis. As we try to improve fuel efficiency, the chassis are becoming lighter and lighter. As they become lighter and lighter, this causes a challenge for the NVH engineers. A lighter chassis typically means a structure that can transmit noises more easily, noises and vibration. So as these noises and vibration are being transmitted through the chassis, they're going to make their way into the cab more easily. So the current state. Currently, the road noise is one of the louder uh, noticeable noises in the vehicle. 
That's not because the road noise has become louder or larger, it's because the other two have gone down. We have reduced wind noise now through more advanced materials in, in the uh, cabs, uh, through uh, more concentration on uh, the airflow around the vehicle, that reduces the, the wind noise. We also have reduced engine noise through advancements in the motor mounts, through active motor mounts, for instance. We have less vibration coming from the engine as well because of the advanced motor mounts. Now, when we talk about NVH analysis, we talk about three main components. In NVH analysis, we concentrate on the source for the, for the first part. And the noise source is the source that actually generates the energy that makes the noise and the vibration. The noise source creates the noise that then is transmitted towards the receiver through transmission paths or transfer paths. These transfer paths can be through the chassis, they can be through the firewall. And then the third component is the receiver. This is the point in which we're concerned about the noise level, the type of noise that makes its way into the cab. So the receiver is the subjective judge of whether this noise is undesirable or not. So damper NVH problems. We've got uh, three main problems I'm going to talk about today. Um, we've got the damper transmitted vibration. This is the vibration that's transmitted from the ground up through the suspension. So this is a big part of the suspension engineer's task is try to reduce this noise. But uh, the transmitted noise through the shock absorber can only be brought down so far while still maintaining the desired uh, handling of the vehicle and the safety of the vehicle. I'm also going to talk about damper emitted noise. This is noise that's actually emitted from the damper. It's uh, noise that's caused by swish, and I'm going to talk about that more later. But the important point is it's noise emitted directly from the damper into the air. I'm also going to talk about damper emitted vibration. That's vibrations that are emitted from the damper. So these vibrations are motion, accelerations, that go through the damper and into the upper shock mount. And I'll talk about that more in detail later. Damper emitted vibration. Damper emitted vibration is a, uh, a very big problem today. What happens is we have uh, vibrations that are emitted from the damper itself. The mechanisms in the damper, it could be from opening and closing of the valves, it could be from friction in the damper, but these vibrations make their way up through the shock body, up through the shock's piston rod, and then from the piston rod, which is attached to the upper shock mount, they can uh, be changed from a mechanical vibration into an audible pressure wave or an acoustic noise. So the upper shock mount acts like a speaker. So the important part is that it gener originates as a vibration, but then ultimately turns into a noise, an acoustic noise, at that upper shock mount. So as we start to talk about chuckle, we need to think about the different frequencies that we're talking about, the frequencies of the excitation as well as the frequencies of the measurements. So in an automotive suspension, we have some particular frequencies that we need to concentrate on. In an automotive suspension, we have the excitation coming from below, from the ground. The road has a very broadband excitation, so it's very flat across most frequencies. But now as we make our way through the suspension and look at the vibrations that end up in the suspension and into the chassis, we have some effects, some dynamic effects, that limit the frequencies in which, which make their way into the suspension. So if we look at uh, the suspension, as a series of springs and dampers. We see that uh, at the very bottom where we contact the road, we have a spring for representing the springiness of the tire and damping of the tire. Damping of the tire is very, very small. We also have the mass of the wheel and the mass of the spindle. We also have the suspension spring and the suspension damper. But if I just want to concentrate on the connection to the lower part of the damper, if I look at the frequencies that make their way past this spring mass damper system made up by the tire spring and the mass of the wheel and spindle, I create a low pass filter effect. This is just due to the mechanical dynamics of this system. So at the tire we have broadband excitation coming in, but at the shock absorber our upper frequencies are very much limited and attenuated. So if I look at a typical suspension, 
there's a natural frequency, the wheel hop natural frequency, usually around 15 hertz, sometimes as low as 10 hertz, sometimes as high as 17 hertz, 20 hertz even. Uh, but typically it's around 15 hertz, so I've shown it here at 15 hertz. We have this um, motion coming in at the tire again, and then we have the motion transmissibility function, which I've, uh, I've written here. If I were to ignore the spring and the damper on the top, just to make a point, this would be the equations in the Laplace domain for the motion transmissibility. So B is my damping, K is my spring constant, M is my mass, and this uh, Laplace domain transfer function is shown here on a Bode plot. So I have a peak here at 15 hertz. After 15 hertz, I start to degrade very rapidly. So the attenuation up in the 20 kilohertz, for instance, is on the order of three orders of magnitude. So I see here I got 10 to the minus fourth on the bottom of the plot here. So it's one ten thousandth of what it was at the lower frequencies. And this is due to this mechanical low pass filter. So though the excitations that we're referring to here are primarily below 25 hertz, we have, we're measuring uh, responses way up in the 600 hertz and up to 20 kilohertz is where we can still hear noise. And as I mentioned before, we have two types of NVH problems in the shock absorber. We have swish and we have chuckle, acoustic and vibrational. So again, the swish phenomena is airborne. It's uh, caused by orifice flow primarily and measured by a microphone. Now this swish uh, phenomena is very easy to measure and identify in the, in the test lab. So this makes this problem pretty well under control. Our customers have said to us that they've got a system that can measure swish, they can, they can identify it early at the component level. Now when I talk about chuckle, that's a different story. The chuckle problem is a mechanical problem and since it transfers from a mechanical vibration to an acoustic noise at the upper shock mount, it's, it's very much coupled to that upper shock mount. So one of the problems that uh, we have with chuckle is that chuckle can appear on one particular shock absorber on one particular car, but the exact same shock absorber on a different car may not have a chuckle problem. So it is automotive, or it's, it's the uh, car in which it's installed, it can be uh, dependent on the impedance of that particular upper mount. So the uh, vibration can be from uh, opening and closing of the valves inside the shock absorber, they can be from friction, there could be different sources. So chuckle is more of a general term that can have different sources. Uh, it's primarily measured with an accelerometer on the upper piston rod and uh, acceleration is used because it is a vibration that causes this problem. We can use force transducers as well but they're not as often used. So as I had said before, the, the vibration is up in the 600 hertz, maybe down in 200 hertz type of range for this chuckle problem, whereas the excitation that's causing these problems is down, limited usually to 25 hertz. Sometimes people test up as high as 50 hertz, but it's much, much lower. Now we have to keep in mind that the audible frequency range is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, is what the human ear can hear. Um, but we're concentrating our effort in this type of uh, analysis down below 1,000 hertz because that's where this chuckle has been observed. And at the very, very high frequencies, the chuckle just doesn't have the energy to uh, transmit through that upper mount. So 600 hertz is usually the upper bound for chuckle. So I'd like to point out here, too, that the, this attenuation is very severe. So we have at 25 hertz, I have an amplitude of 0.5, whereas down at 600 hertz, I have an amplitude of 0.005. So I talked earlier about the transfer function and how the higher frequencies are attenuated as we go through the suspension and before we get to the shock absorber. Now the, uh, the road will transmit a lot of the lower frequencies, below 25 hertz for instance, into that shock absorber. Whereas at the higher frequencies, up in the 600 hertz for instance, where chuckle problems have been reported, we're a factor of 100 down of what's transmitted through that suspension. So most often in the test benches, we put in lower frequency excitation because that's primarily where the road excitation is when it goes into the shock absorber, but we're measuring out to these much higher frequencies like 600 hertz. So we have to keep that in mind. There's the excitation frequency and the measurement frequency. 
So we're measuring usually limited to 1,000 hertz, where, uh, where our test input is usually limited to 25 hertz. And the uh, ears can hear that higher frequency because our ears are capable of hearing down to 20 hertz and all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So as we talk about the different frequencies that are going to be present in this test, we talk about the excitation frequency that's down in the 25 hertz range. This excitation frequency may be a pure sinusoid, it could be road profile, it could be bro uh, pink noise that's shaped to concentrate the noise content down below 25 hertz. But the area in which we're concerned with, with chuckle is up in the 600 hertz. This is in the acoustic area. So if we have an excitation to the shock absorber at 25 hertz, but yet we have a nonlinearity, whether it's in the shock absorber or in the test bench, up in the 600 hertz, we're going to see content from both the excitation as well as content from this nonlinearity. So the content of the 600 hertz could be from a swish, for instance, it could be acoustic, or it could be through chuckle, it could be through the vibration. So to uh, make a test bench that's good for measuring these higher order harmonics, we need to be concerned with the test bench's ability to not produce higher order harmonics itself. And also the test bench's ability to not create higher order harmonics in the input. We also need to be worried about the uh, high bandwidth measurement transducers. If we have low bandwidth measurement transducers, it's not going to pick up these high frequency uh, noises that we are after. So to first look at the actuator rod itself, the actuation technology that we're employing in this MTS damper system is going to use electric actuation. And the reason why we're using electric actuation is because the electric actuation has very low distortion, very high bandwidth. This low distortion is needed to get, to get good fidelity so we don't introduce erroneously any high frequency content. So here's an example of a real response from the electric actuator. The electric actuator in this example has some advanced controls already incorporated into it where we can reduce the broadband noise into the actuator, we can reduce the higher order harmonics into the actuator. So right here I've got a blue trace which is a synthetic trace. This synthetic trace is perfect by design because it is synthetic. Whereas the red trace is the actual response from our actual system at 15 hertz. We can see that we have very good fidelity no higher order harmonics. We don't have any broadband noise on that signal at all. Also, our MTS test bench is going to have very high resonant frequencies so that we don't introduce any erroneous vibrations, any content up at those high frequencies like 600 hertz. MTS is very well versed with making such frames. We make frames for the elastomer test industry as well. There we need to make frames that are capable of testing up to 1,000 hertz. So here's just an example of how higher order harmonics can make their way into the measurement. If we had a frame resonance, for instance, that emitted some 600 hertz content, just because the frame naturally resonated at that frequency, and since the actuation um, maybe doesn't have frequency in that range, any nonlinearities in the actuator can excite these higher order harmonics. So here's an example of how a distortion at 600 hertz, for instance, may, in, may disrupt a original excitation that's at 25 hertz. So here I've shown what a 25 hertz signal looks like with 600 hertz superimposed on it. Now in this example, if our actuator is exciting the damper rod with a 25 hertz signal, and just for argument's sake, if I were to say the damper rod act like a pure damper, meaning the force is equal to the damping coefficient times the velocity, our force coming out of it and the motion coming out of it should just be a pure sinusoid as well. But now if we have some external disturbance or external distortion that adds into that response or that measurement at the upper shock area, we can see that these two signals are going to superimpose upon each other and we're going to have a sign on sign type result. Well, the test engineer and the design engineers cannot discern what part of this 600 hertz came from the machine or whether it came from the shock absorber. So they're, if they see a 600 hertz content in their data, if we are introducing 600 hertz from our frame, it may uh, cause an error in their judgment. They may think it's coming from the shock absorber itself. 
So also, I want to talk about the uh, excitation source, the actuator. Here too, if our actuator introduces a higher order harmonic, for instance, a 600 hertz harmonic, on top of that 25 hertz signal, that's going to show up in the response. Again, if I were to assume a pure damper, where force equals damping times velocity, then the motion at the upper mount, as well as the force at the upper mount, is going to uh, directly transmit that motion, that sinusoid, with the 600 hertz content in it. Again, the design engineer cannot discern whether that 600 hertz came from his shock absorber through a chuckle phenomena or whether it was actually in the signal on the input side from the actuator. So that's why we need very good total harmonic distortion, a signal that does not have higher order harmonics in it. Also, we need high bandwidth force and motion transducers. So for the force transducer, MTS is going to employ a acceleration compensation technique which we use on our high frequency elastomer test systems. MTS has patents in this area to improve the acceleration compensation. So we have the best acceleration compensation in the industry and we, we can use that same uh, technology in this damper system so we can have very high bandwidth, very high frequency force measurement. Also we're going to offer acceleration measurement on both the input side, on the actuator rod side, as well as on the output side. So if we add an additional motion transducer on the actuator side to measure, ex measure the motion via acceleration instead of via LVDT or via encoder, we can capture higher bandwidth information about that motion. So accelerometers are a better transducer to measure motion at high frequencies because there's high accelerations. So for the new NVH test system that MTS is developing, we've incorporated all the attributes that are required for a good NVH damper system. We've incorporated the high bandwidth force transducer and displacement transducer. We've incorporated high resonant frequency frames so we can keep any of those uh, disturbances from the frame itself from making its way into the measurement. We're also incorporating in a high fidelity actuator that will also prevent any introduction of higher order dynamics or higher order harmonics. So these things combined is going to make an optimized system specifically for chuckle measurement for NVH damper industry. Thank you for your time and if you'd like any more information about the NVH damper system or any MTS products, contact us at MTS.